Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for hanging around till for the last session. Uh, in today's talk, I'm going to talk about uh, an um, Apache Crail, which is a new incubating project uh, at the aim of doing a data processing at the speed of hardware. So essentially, the 100 gigabit per second essentially says the hardware speed or commodity networking that you can buy today. I'm Animesh Trivedi. I work at IBM Research Lab in Zurich, and I'm one of the co-founder and committer of the Apache Crail project. So throughout the whole uh, data work summit this year, we have heard about the importance of data, which is coming from every which way, right? And as the amount of data increases, so does the demand for the real-time data processing, right? So if you look at what is happening at the hardware, right? So hardware also has been catching up uh, with the with the demand to store more and more data and access more and more data over the network, right? So if you look 10 years ago um, and uh, what we have today, we can see an order of magnitude performance improvement into the networking technology. So we had one gig, um, um, one gig network, and now we have 10, 25, 40 gigabit networking in the cloud today. 100 gig and 200 gig you can buy from Manalox. Same happened with the storage, right? So disk is or was used to be and also is a very popular way of storing data, but at the same time, uh, Flash, NVMe, all these um, high-performance storage as well has emerged in the enterprise computing, which gives almost an order of magnitude performance gain. And we have seen the next generation of uh, storage like Intel 3D X point memory, which is we can buy them today, right? So this trend is going to continue. At the same time, we have seen CPU performance stalled due to various thermal and manufacturing limitations, right? So there are more of them, but they're still more or less around the three gigahertz clock cycle mark, right? But as the Moore's law continue, we are seeing um, sort of a diversification of in which um, the extra transistor that you have, they are going to manifest themselves, right? So for example, uh, instead of just having plain 100 gig networking, you actually have a programmable network card. So you have RDMA technology, you have GPUs, you have program programmable storage, right? You have FPGAs in the cloud. So this is the way that uh, extra transistors are being available. So not just the speed, but also the IO diversify, IO diversify has also increased dramatically, right? So the goal of Crail project is essentially, given this current hardware landscape, performance and diversity, how can we feed uh, the data processing stacks like Hadoop, like Spark, like Flink, all the other popular data processing frameworks that you have seen at the speed of hardware. So, and these, hardwares, these hardware devices essentially today can do 100 plus gigabit bandwidth and latencies in early microseconds, so one to 10 microsecond latencies, right? So that's a key challenge that we are trying to solve in Apache Crail project. Okay. So what is it actually, what we have built? So Apache Crail is a distributed data store which is designed from scratch to facilitate data sharing at the speed of hardware. So there are two key terms, right? Storage and share, right? So what do we store, right? Where do we store? We stored in DRAM, we stored in Flash, we stored in any generation of storage technology do you have? We have multiple front end. I'll talk a little bit later uh, about those in detail. And what do we want to store in this? What do we want to share, right? All the intermediate data that your compute jobs are generating, right? So one of the very popular example is shuffle data, right? Everyone is writing and everyone is reading your shuffle data. Then there is a variable like broadcast. You could have um, a long running job pipelines, right? In, like in TES, right? That the output of one job is the input to the next job, right? So this is all the data which is shared between the different stages, different jobs, different pipeline. We want to store this data in Crail. And the hope is that by accelerating the data sharing, right? so this is what we are targeting, by accelerating the data sharing, we will accelerate your workload. And uh, obviously, we are not the first one to have a look at these devices, how they can be integrated into data processing. But the hope is that by unifying all the different isolated incompatible efforts right, under a single framework, which is Apache Crail, we can derive more value out of our effort and we can integrate those, um, in, we can integrate Apache Crail in a standard way to all the frameworks that the, you guys know and love, right, like Spark and Hadoop. 
uh, it's all written in Java 8 with the multiple client language support, front end, right? A bit of a history that it was started at uh, IBM Research Lab in Zurich. And since last November, it has been an Apache incubator project. So it's fairly new. OK, so brief architecture picture, right? This is, um, there's nothing fundamentally new here. That's, so here we have, we deploy Apache Krill as a service. It's a distributed data store. So we have obviously have a logically centralized name node that keeps track of metadata in the system. Uh, we have a bunch of data nodes, essentially, which are responsible for storing and servicing uh, client requests to access the data which is stored in the, um, in the data nodes. Uh, you can have a data nodes for a different type of storage and networking technology, right? So essentially, a combination of storage and networking technology is what defines a data node. And then you have a bunch of clients which are interacting with the name node and data node to store and retrieve the data that they have um, stored in Krill. So the red line here essentially are control RPCs. Um, obviously, between data node and name node, there are periodic heartbeats. Clients are looking up the metadata. And then the green line essentially are the data operation that go between the client and the data node directly. So a bit more detail, exactly what, what's happening in the data node. So data node is essentially responsible for exposing your storage and networking resources to the system, right? So as I said before, it could be a combination of storage and networking technology. So we have currently uh, implemented uh, data nodes for which can store data in the DRAM and serve using the RDMA technology. Or you can use DRAM plus TCP sockets to serve the data, right? Uh, we have a flash integration, and we have implemented NVMe over Flash protocol in Java uh, to serve the data directly from the Flash to the clients. Uh, we have, if, if, we if the Krail figure out that it's a co-located client with the data node, we can do local DRAM to memcopy via shared memory access. And also, we have local Flash access using SPDK. Right? So the whole purpose of the data node is just to receive the client request. I want to retrieve this data which I have stored here. Please uh, give me that, and, and data node essentially transfer the data using the best of the networking technology. So name node. Um, name node is responsible for keeping track of metadata in the system. And the way it does it is that whatever the storage capacity is exposed by the data node, it divides in, in terms of blocks, right? So it's a very similar to what HDFS does, right? But its the size here is fairly small, just a megabyte, or you can even do a few kilobytes as well. Um, internally, uh, Krail maintains an hierarchical node tree, like what you do in a normal file system. But, just, but apart from just having directory and files, we have lots of, uh, we have a bit more type of files and nodes that we have implemented. For example, we have streaming files, right? They have a particular semantics with them that you can fix the size and you can say that as soon as the new data arrives, it push out the old data for the garbage collection automatically, right? Then you have multi-files where you can generate a virtual view out of many files as if they will appear to a single file. We have a key value interface, right? You can create a tables, which is like directories, but a bit more semantics, right? You have a value files, which are just like files, but you cannot have a nested files uh, within a table, right? Because it's just one deep, that's your key value store. And, and all these things are pluggable, right? So if you come up with your, your own use case that maybe I want a different type of node, uh, you can write that. And essentially, clients connect to the name node to create new nodes, like a file or key values or streaming files. Uh, there's certain allocation policy, uh, how the data is going to be stored and how it's going to be distributed between the data nodes. And, and a single node essentially can contain blocks from your DRAM, from your flash, or any other storage technology that you want to use. Right. So a single file essentially can have two blocks from DRAM, three blocks from Flash, and again, two blocks from DRAM. It's all mix and match. Everything is possible. Clients. Um, clients here essentially means um, um, that, that the entity which is responsible for is storing and reading data from Krail, right? So in most of the cases, it would be your compute framework, which is actually generating your intermediate data, right? I'll talk a little bit more later. How does this look? Um, but uh, essentially, it creates a file, it creates a node, it stores the data in there, and after that, someone else picks, opens the file and reads it. That's it. There's nothing happening more than that, right? And as I explained before, we have a 
native API to the Crail, which is a simple hierarchical file system. Uh, on top of that, we have built a key value interface. Uh, we have HDFS binding, so essentially you can use Crail as a drop-in replacement for your HDFS. And we have a streaming API as well, which is work in progress. So now the fundamental question. So this looks so far OK, right? There's nothing crazy new. So where does the performance come from in the system? Well, uh, there are three key ideas in the system which are designed specifically to deliver performance. The first one is that when you have a very fast network at the bottom, right? So here's a typical stack that it looks like. Or, and so once the data comes in at the bottom, then it has to funnel through all the different layers in your system. For example, your Ethernet processing, your TCP IP, and your socket right, in the operating system. And then it shows up in the user space. But the way the current stacks are deployed, it doesn't even finish there, right? Then you might be running in a container. Then it has to go in a JVM. There might be caching involved, like from Elixir, right? Then there's a Spark. And inside there, you might have your application such as TerraSort, right? So this is one of the key reasons why, even though at the bottom of the stack, you might have 100 gigabit bandwidth and one microsecond round trip network latency, a very fraction of it is only shows, shows up at the top, right? So what we have done about it? Uh, well, we advocate that you can use the RDMA technology, which has historically its root in supercomputers, but today it is found in the cloud and commodity data center. You can rent VMs with RDMA NIC from Microsoft Azure. And uh, there are other very, uh, there are lots of research in applying RDMA technology into commodity data processing as well. So the whole idea of uh, RDMA is that by splitting your control and the data path separately, right? you can pre-allocate and pre-set up and pre-commit lots of resources, which you do not have to touch later once the data is coming at the speed of the network. Right? And you can map these resources all the way from the hardware into your JVM. right? So your JVM can access your network card directly without having to go through all these layers for the data transformation and data processing. The same goes for flash access. So NVMe over Fabric, which is NVMe over F, is an extension of RDMA technology, which is defined to access data from Flash in a similar way as would you access uh, data from DRAM. And also, you, have, uh, you might be aware of SPDK and DPDK efforts, uh, where the whole idea is that application take controls of networking, and application knows the best when to send packet, when to send message, when to receive message, and how to do processing, right? And by the integration of these things together, this is where the performance comes from. Second, um, most of the data processing frameworks that we are using, right, they are running in some sort of virtualized container environment, right? So obviously, when the data comes from the network, right, it's coming in a stream, and you have to show, you have to somehow materialize it as an object on which your application can work. So most of the time when you see a picture like this, it just shows, yeah, data comes from the network and here is the object. But in reality, what is happening is that data is also, even if it hits, if it, even if it is in JVM, it is still has to go through multiple layers of processing which are developed independently of each other. So it has to buffer their multiple copies, then their object allocation, there's a heap management, JC might kick in while you're trying to access data at the microsecond latencies, and obviously there's a sealization and desealization that's happening, and all of this essentially is killing the performance. So while developing Crail, essentially, this is, was one of the key concerns for us, is to, um, when we are writing a piece of software, right, then we are asking ourselves, is this step necessary? Can this step be pushed ahead or after this step? Right. Um, so the whole narrative or whole design thinking shift from thinking about one gigabit network and disk to thinking about 100 gigabit and one microsecond. Can I execute this code path under a microsecond? Right. That's the mentality that we have when we are building the data path of Apache Crail. So essentially, we have to do our software time budgeting. We have to do lots of pre-allocation. We have to do smart caching. We have to reuse the objects. There's an ownership idea. Who owns this particular buffer at what point in time? And uh, there's a smart, lot of smart engineering has gone into to make sure that you actually do get one microsecond latency at the top of the stack. Third thing, 
in a distributed system, right? You have a client which is trying to access data. Let's say we have a four data nodes here, which is trying to access data from these two data nodes, right? And there's another client which is not aware of the existence of the first client, so obviously they both are competing for the resources from the data node one. And if the data node one happens to serve a critical piece of data to the both clients, then it's bad. They are both are sharing and they both are bottlenecked by the data node one here, right? So here, essentially, the name node component, which is a centralized component in our stack, right? It is responsible for keeping track of where data is allocated. Is it performance critical or not? How do you distribute this data around, right? Uh, we, we use randomization to make sure that the data is not ending up on the same data node all the time, right? So there's a fit that the load is evenly distributed in the cluster. Uh, we have asynchronous interface that meant that you can fire up your I.O. request and you can go on to do more compute while the I.O. request is finishing up. We have a smart buffering. So, for example, if you are doing sequential access, then we know that while you're trying to consume the content in the buffer that we have right now, we can fire up the next request to fill up the next buffer content and we can overlap compute from I.O. And of course, we have a data allocation policies. You can think, you can say that, oh, I want all of my data in DRAM and make sure it doesn't touch flash or vice versa, or you are happy with the mix configuration, right? So three key ideas. Use high performance user level IO to bypass heavy thick layered network data processing, uh, which is supported by many of the modern day networking and storage cards. Uh, do very careful software design for the microsecond era, where you know that data is coming at the speed of 100 gig and one microsecond. And in a distributed setting, you have to think of the cluster and how the I.O. requests are orchestrated in the cluster. So you have to be careful about that thing, essentially. So at this point, you might be thinking, oh, but it could be that I might not have the fancy top-of-the-line hardware, right? So that's true. So maybe you will not get benefit from the first, but you still get benefit from the second and third item that we have worked on, right? So here's a full picture of the stack. How does it look like? At the bottom, you can see the different um, storage technologies where you might want your data to reside at the end of the day, right? You can store it in the DRAM, NVMe, maybe in 3DXP flash. We are also in the process of integrating GPU memory. So what does that mean? That you can tell Crail to please store this data in the GPU memory, and as soon as the data is stored, you can kick start the computation on the GPU, and once the computation is done, you can extract the data again from the GPU, right? then these individual storage resources essentially are connected via the fast network, essentially. So example of that is 100 gigabit Rocky networks. Essentially, this is the technology you can buy today from Mellanox. Uh, Intel as well. Intel has OmniPath technology. You can get that. Um, on top of that, we have a various networking interfaces. Uh, we can use a normal TCP sockets. We have RDMA interface in JVM. We have NVMe over Fabrics integrated in the JVM. And as well, we have a DPDK interface in the JVM, but that's essentially is not, we will, we will not recommend that. It's not production ready. And, and in between, essentially, sits Apache Krill, which takes these different components and exposes them as a storage resources in a hierarchical files system namespace. And on top of that, we have built various front ends. So we have a file system, we have a streaming API, we have a key value. And we have HDFS API where you can do a drop-in replacement for your HDFS. But I should be clear, it's not meant for the drop-in replacement for your HDFS needs, right? As I explained before, it is targeting intermediate data, right? A data which is only valuable during the, your computation, right? As soon as you achieve your result and you want to do a long-term storage, you should store it on your permanent storage, whatever you have, like HDFS or Ceph or whatever you have. Uh, and on top of that, essentially, where you see the red line, uh, we have benchmarks, which we have shown to deliver tens of gigabytes of bandwidth. And you can access data from the remote DRAM, remote flash in tens of microseconds of the data, uh, tens of microseconds of latencies. And on top of that, you have a data processing framework. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how can you integrate Crail into those. So, so far, we have focused on Apache Spark, which is one of the more popular data processing framework. So one of the things, um, so the integration with this Spark is written as a pluggable module, right? You can 
You can download that. Every, uh, by the way, everything that I talk about in this presentation, everything is open source. Um, so we have written a pluggable module for Spark that you can download. And it has a broadcast module. So broadcast is one of the frequent operations that happens in Spark, and especially in the Spark SQL processing, right? Uh, so broadcast has a pattern that a one, like here example, a Spark drivers writes a variable in Crail, right? It says that, okay, I have written the broadcast file number one, let's say. So you can say the job ID, broadcast, file number one, right? And that object is then stored in Crail. And then the Spark tells its executor, please, everyone, go read from Crail the broadcast variable I have written there, right? So every of these executor go and read the broadcast variable. So that's one of the examples that you can use Crail to accelerate data sharing in Spark. Second example is Shuffle, right? So that's another very popular, very network-heavy operation that typically everyone recommends to avoid as much as possible. Uh, but uh, as, as I'll show later, it doesn't necessarily have to be so. So here's another example where in the map phase, there might be a bunch of Spark executor which are generating data. Right? And they can be indexed because it's a hierarchical file system. They can be indexed, for example, on a job ID. Then you can create a directory which says it's shuffle, slash again. Shuffle stays zero, slash again. And you can tell I'm executor number one. Right? So you can do indexed based on the name of the directory. Right? And they all can write their own data. And once the, sorry, once the map phase is finished, then you can move to the reduce phase, where each of the executor then go again and read the directory and all the data is already there, essentially. And the writing of the data and the reading of the data through Crail, essentially, happens at the speed of the hardware. That's a key idea. So a bit of performance numbers. Um, I'm going to talk about latency, bandwidth, and IOPS number in a distributed setting in a JVM, right? And this is one of the things you have to be careful about, that whenever you see um, crazy good numbers, Often it happens, at least in my experience, that it's always like a C benchmark or C++, uh, and then it is left to the, as a reader's exercise, trivial exercise, how can we push this number from the C into the Java, into the virtualized runtime environment, right? So the number I'm going to show you, they are the JVM numbers in a distributed setting. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, performance at the level of a Spark, right? So where I'll talk about how do we accelerate broadcast, and then the group by, which is a shuffle intensive operation. Workloads, we have a TerraSort SQL join. And, and as I explained before, right, um, Crail allow you to mix and match DRAM and Flash. So I'm going to show you an interesting setting where we will, um, we will gradually move from all memory deployment to all Flash deployment. And because Crail is fast, you'll see the performance either stays the same or gets better when we use Flash. So it's a kind of enables you to do all Flash desegregated setting using Crail. The number, the, the machines that we have, they are a mix of x86 and Power8 machines with a 100 gig network and 256 gig of DDRAM3 and NVMe Flash. OK, first. So this is the bandwidth experiment from DRAM using RDMA, right? Uh, we have read and write. On the x-axis, we have the request size. And on the y-axis, we have a bandwidth from 0 to 120. Well, 100 essentially is our theoretical max that we can do. So as you can see, essentially around the 1K mark, uh, the performance is start to reach between 80 to 100, per, 100 gigabits per second. And essentially, that's you can expect in, in the JVM from your client. And this is, by the way, is a single core experiment. Uh, because of the RDMA, the network processing is offloaded to the NIC. So it's a single core driving this performance. Second, uh, latency experiment. So this is a file read latency. So you have a file in Crail, which a client comes in. It opens a file, it reads the file, and it closes the file. And this is the latency. So the first two bar here essentially shows you the micro benchmark latencies that we have in a C benchmark, right? This is the best you can get, the kind of latencies that you see in the MPI implementation, right? So send receive are around 4.5 microsecond. RDMA read is around 2.3 microsecond, if I'm not mistaken. And in Crail, to read this file, essentially it takes around 11.2 microsecond to read the to open, read, and close the file. And essentially the operation of opening, closing, and reading a file essentially is two RPC and one RDMA read. 
So this is essentially fairly close to what you can get from the hardware in a JVM in a distributed setting. Third, um, now these are NVMEF numbers. So all the performance numbers here are coming from Flash. So data is stored in Flash. Um, so here we have three lines. Um, so the blue line here essentially is kind of to give an idea of how the DRAM number look like. The red line is essentially when you are actually accessing the data from Flash one by one, right? So here is the Flash bandwidth that you can, you can expect to get. And this is coming over 100 gig remote Flash. So as you can see, around 64K to 128 kilobyte request size, it goes to the 12.1 uh, gigabits per second, which is 100 gig bandwidth here, essentially. But if you give enough hint to the system that, oh, I'm going to do a sequential access from Flash, and I'm planning to have few number of outstanding requests in flight, and I'm, to, I'm going to com overlap compute with I.O., then the CRAIL can do much better. And with the smart buffering and I.O. scheduling logic we have in CRAIL, we can essentially hide all the media latency overhead that you might have from the flash, and the performance you get is fairly close to the DRAM bandwidth. So this is not super surprising, but essentially the fact that all the work that we have put in designing a smart I.O. path in CRAIL essentially pays off. Um, here is a file read latency experiment, similar to what we have with the DRAM, but this time this is from Flash. Um, so the key idea here, the key takeaway message here is that um, the Flash latency, the base Flash latencies that we have, which you can see from the first bar, which is the SPDK local best the latency we can extract, is around 60 microsecond. And in a CRAIL, using the remote Flash devices, we were able to get something around 70, 70, one or 75 microsecond latencies. With the 4K size, when you're reading the full flash page, um, under 80 microsecond, we can deliver the whole file in a distributed JVM setting. Now, metadata IOPS, right? So you have clients which are constantly doing lookup to your name node, right? So there's a lot of RPC traffic there. Um, so how does that look like, right? So here on the x-axis, we have number of concurrent clients, what we have for CRAIL. And the y-axis, we have IOPS that the client is serve, that the name node is serving to the client in millions of requests per second. And the three lines you see here, essentially they are sort of um, uh, the blue, sorry, green line here is a one name node. Orange line is a two name node. You can partition the whole name space, and you can have you can have a four name node, which is the blue line at the very top. And as you partition the name space, essentially you get almost a linear scalability with the name number of operations the name node can support, essentially. So the single name node, we are close to 10, 8 to 9 million IOPS per second that a system can support. OK, so some application level benchmark. Essentially, I talked about our broadcast and the shuffle modules that we have written for the Terrasort, right? So here's the broadcast performance number. So on the x-axis, we have the typical latencies that we see. And on the y-axis, we have the percentage, right? So here's a small benchmark where we generated a million broadcast variables. And we plotted how the different, what was the latencies that the different executor read this benchmark, read this broadcast variable with. So the red line essentially is what you see in Spark, right? So you can see around 80%, uh, at the 80% mark, you have at the millisecond latency to read the broadcast variable in Spark. And with the green line, you can see that we are almost in a mark of 10 to 15 microsecond, I believe. Um, so almost like two to three orders of magnitude performance improvement for the Spark broadcast variable read benchmark. Here's a micro benchmark for group by, which is a shuffle heavy um, operation, right? So at the top, you see uh, the performance of uh, Spark, which is accelerated by CRAIL. Uh, the Spark executors have one, four, or eight cores uh, to execute the benchmark. And at the bottom, you see the vanilla Spark performance that you get, right? So with the, if you see at the red line, a red line is that, I'm um, sorry, on the y-axis, we have the throughput that you see on the network, right? So you can see with the red line, um, the performance fluctuates around 10, 15 gigabits per second mark. And at the end of it, essentially around 75 second mark, the benchmark finishes, right? And the same benchmark for CRAIL is essentially accelerated by 5x. And you can see the peak bandwidth that we get is around 70 to 80, 70 to 80 gigabits per second, which essentially 
um, kind of um, uh, confirm our hypothesis that we had in the beginning that if we accelerate the data sharing, the whole workload level performance should also improve, right? Now the TerraSort. So this is one of the um, I/O heavy workloads that essentially everyone runs. Uh, this was the experiment we did on 128 machine cluster connected with 100 gig networking. Uh, we sorted 12.8 terabyte of data. And uh, here you can see the splits. The first bar essentially is the vanilla Spark, which took almost 540 seconds to sort this amount of data. You can see the split between shuffle and sort and classify, which is the map phase. And by using the broadcast and shuffle accelerator plugin from Crail, we were managed to reduce the runtime by 6x here. And, and, and if you want to understand how, where the 6x performance is coming from, you can look at the network profile, essentially, right? So again, here is on the x-axis, we have the runtime of the, ben the runtime of the benchmark. And on the y-axis, we have the throughput of the network that we observe. So you can see with the vanilla spark, we are kind of fluctuating around the mark of 7, 8 gigabit, gigabits per second out of 100. And the similar performance for the Crail looks pretty much close to 70 gigabits per second all to all um, bandwidth. And at this point in time, we also talked to Mellanox folks, and they said that uh, for this size of the cluster, for this switch, essentially, the switch was the bottleneck from delivering all 100 or 90 gigabits all to all type of communication. But here, essentially, the improvement, the 7, 8x improvement in the network bandwidth essentially shows up at 7, 8 times performance improvement for your workload. Um, the SQL, uh, actually we have TPCDS numbers as well, but they are not in these slides, they are on the website, online website. But there is a small equijoin experiment, and uh, there are four phases in the equijoin in Spark. You have input, you have a hash, you have join, and then you write out. And here as well, we see the similar trend. By using Crail, uh, the performance of join was accelerated by 2x. And the question is whether you get 2x or 6x also depends upon your balance of your compute and I.O. intensity, right? So if you have an I.O. intensive workload, you get more. If you have a compute intensive workload, you get a bit less. And here's the, one of the last experiments, which is a flash disaggregation, right? So the, here, the first bar, this is, this is also TerraSort, but this is on eight machine cluster that we have locally in our lab. Um, the first bar that you see here is 100 zero, which is on the x-axis, which shows the memory to flash ratio that we have in our system. So 100 zero means that all the data was kept in memory all the time. And the performance of the Spark is shown on the y-axis. So it takes around 100 and I think eight second to sort, um, I think this was 600 gigabyte of data. And then we show that, okay, using accelerated Crail, um, if we, if, we, if we stayed the same configuration, we use 100 zero, that means we kept all the data in memory, uh, we are around 20, I think 28 second mark. So obviously that's fast, that's no doubt about that part. But from 100 zero, we move gradually to 0, 100, where all the data, all the shuffle data was kept on flash, right? So the performance gradually improves, sorry, performance gradually decreases because instead of accessing data from DRAM, we are accessing from flash. but even when we hit the all flash deployment, we are still two to three times faster than all in-memory Spark deployment. And this is all because of the accelerated IO path that we have in Crail, right? So essentially, the Crail offers the possibility for complete storage disaggregation, right? So we already have, we have plugins for um, IBM flash systems. If you have IBM flash system, you can use Crail to access data uh, from the flash system, and that will show a similar performance trend um, and you can think of instead of beefing up your system with a DRAM, replacing DRAM with a flash becomes a real possibility. So current status and future plans, right? So the whole idea of this talk is essentially to convince you guys to go and try out Krill. It's a new incubated project, so obviously we are learning the ropes and we are trying to build community around our project. Um, since November 2017, we are incubation. And a few weeks ago, we have our first source release. Uh, we are working on multiple fronts, fronts, some of which are listed here, essentially. We have a C++ 
uh, binding, uh, which is work in progress, but we want to do provide a Python, Rust, or essentially your favorite language here, essentially what you want to have. Uh, we are working to integrate uh, Crail into Flink and Hadoop, and especially with the serverless Lambda compute frameworks. We are looking into TensorFlow, how can we accelerate data sharing in the machine learning framework. Uh, we have already integrated with the SnapML, which is IBM um, machine learning library, which is available in the data science experience uh, toolkit. But you can think of whatever compute framework you are writing, or in general, um, you can think of Crail as a data center-wide bus, that every time, any time you have to share data, you can think of that you can write in Crail and read from Crail, right? Um, we are working on multiple data nodes, integration, different technologies, different way of doing things, obviously automatic packaging and testing, unit test. Uh, we have a small prototype in a containerized environment. We have Docker images for the Crail for you to try. Um, but obviously that needs a bit more work and uh, all the fun stuff that, you know, love to do with the Apache Krill project. We, so please come have a look and uh, join our team. So. Most of the results that I have presented here, which was part of a group effort and a collaboration with multiple people, uh, some of which are listed here. Uh, Patrick, Jonas, Mikhail, Adrian, Bernard, and we hope to grow community a bit more. So we have a website, we have a blog, please come and join our mailing list with Jira, and we also have a Slack channel, so that seems to be the new thing. Uh, so most of the developers that we are, we are uh, active on the Slack channel, so we will be very happy to help you out, set it up, deliver the same results that we have in your environment, and help you set up Krill. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. What happens if you don't have RDMA or it's down Right, so as I explained before, right, so the performance from those accelerated hardware is one aspect of the whole system. So there's still the two, or two more principles where we have carefully uh, designed the I.O. path, thinking that, okay, data is going to come through in a microsecond at the 100 gig speed, right? So if data is not coming at that speed, it's still fine. You still get benefit from the thin and lean software stack and the careful JVM object management and reuse and caching and all these things. So we have results, but we haven't shown it here, but uh, you still get substantial performance improvement even in that case, yeah. Um, well, it is part of the roadmap. Um, it should not be, we are agnostic to the technology, right? So if MRAM comes as a PCI device or a front side, right, as a, it, it should not be, it should not be a no-brainer. We just have to maybe modify our data node, write a new data, new type of data node, which stores data in MRAM and serves using TCP or RDMA, whatever networking technology you have, and that's about it. But it's, it's a, we have evaluation on 3DX point for Intel. And there we see performance very close to the DRAM performance. Um, but um, the idea here is that we are not tied specifically to any networking or hardware technology. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, um, it's, it's a good question. So I would say the key difference is essentially um, the performance and the goal of the project, right? So in our evaluation of Alexio, they were nowhere close to these performance that we are delivering. So the performance that you see with the Alexio, with the gigabytes and, and um, like 30, 40 gigabytes per second, they are often the local memory bandwidth. They, they are, in our evaluation from the remote network, it's, they, are, they, are, they are nowhere near their performance. And the second thing is the goal of the project, right? So Alexio is trying to become this um, um, overlay virtualized storage stack where at the back you have multiple backends where the data will eventually go, right? So it's supposed to be caching layer. Crail is not trying to be a caching layer. There is no final destination of data in Crail. So whatever data you store in Crail, it is there. It's not going to move gradually to HDFS or your S3 bucket or anywhere else. It's there, you read it out, and eventually someone has to delete it, right? So it's meant for a temporary storage, that and there. Sorry, I, I'm confused. Crail is meant for temporary storage, but Alexio is a cache. Alexio is, is trying to be a cache. Right. But isn't that uh, very 
you you can you you can use Grail for yeah absolutely yeah sure you 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 can use Grail for the caching as well it's a it's a no brainer uh, but uh, um, the, the thing I was trying to say is that anything that Elixir does Grail can do but with a better performance. Yeah. It depends upon the definition of commodity. <laughs> I would disagree with that. Okay, so think of this way, right? When we started the project, when we start thinking about this project, 40 gig, 40 gig networking was what 100 gig is today. But today, 40 gig, you can, uh, you can uh, rent it in any cloud provider, right? So same with the flash, right? So what we have performance today, you will see in cloud, because there's no denying these devices will eventually recede to cloud, and this becomes commodity, right? It is commodity from the point of view that you can go and buy it. It's not one-off prototype. There are multiple vendors that which are building here, Chelsea, Mellanox, in, Intel has in Omnipath. And, and the software abstraction, because we are tied to the software abstraction, which is this OFED RDMA stack or DPTK. So these are essentially, let's say, more established than what you might have as underneath hardware. But the trend itself that you might have diverse I.O., different type of accelerator, different type of devices, that's going to continue. So. Yeah. Um, the question is, um, if you really want to participate, um, how do you get your hands on hardware that supports this? Right? Yes. Um, and that's the point I'm trying to make with commodity, right? Mm -hmm. As a normal user, as someone who is an average, maybe a half a committer, who, who doesn't ha have their hands on um, high grade mm -hmm. device hardware, this, this is definitely key, right? Right. Yep. And, and buy this. Right. Right. You really have to carefully consider the cost. And absolutely. Um, I, yes, I, I agree with that concern. So, and in that context, I think we are hopeful that resources that we have at the lab, and we are also, IBM is commi um, committing to the open source strategy, right? And the resources we have and what you can get from the cloud, um, it's a sort of bootstrap process, but the idea is that the fundamentally, the challenge for us was that to shift our mindset from thinking about milliseconds and ones of gigabytes of bandwidth to think about microsecond and 100 gig, right? And that changes the way you design your software stack because this, this is not meant for this. The, the, the idea is that in the software stack that we are trying to build as Apache Rail, it doesn't have a hardware specific thing there, but it is, it is, it is. It is, it is designed to deliver the hardware performance you have. If you don't have it, it's OK. But if you have it, you'll get the performance. But I agree with the concern. Perhaps we've already covered. Apologies if you just connected and then late. What happens if a node fails? How do you I store some data in the train? Yeah. Some hardware somewhere. Something somewhere fails. Yes. So, um, so that's a tricky point. So that's where we, we are. So there are two components I explained before. There's a data node. And there's a name node, right? Let's say the data node fails, right? So the argument that we have and what we have evaluated so far and makes sense for us is that you don't have to have built-in redundancy in every layer that you have. What will happen more often is that if your data fails, data node fails, you will lose some broadcast or shuffle file. And the Spark will roll back to this checkpoint and it will restart the job. Right? You have your compute framework which has a redundancy built in. So there's no at least in our sense, if we, don't, we don't see a logic of redoing this same layer in the data set, right? In the, in the data node to provide five redundancy and those things. If you need that, then there are better projects. You can use HDFS for that. That's meant for those things to provide high availability, right? The name node part, which is work in progress. If name node goes down, then yes, it's the system becomes unusable. And um, as we discussed, I think we are looking into one of the uh, high bandwidth uh, consensus protocols to replicate and have a uh, next high availability data node which is trying to keep up with um, uh, the changes that is happening. So what we have right now is that we have a logging facility for RPCs. So all the RPCs that come in, they are logged. So there, if there is a second name node, it can just replay the log. That we can do still today. But to make it better uh, performant and uh, all the numbers I've shown, which are with a single name node, 
but uh, we have to build and we have to evaluate what will happen when the, all the features are on. Sorry? Uh, no, the, the Snap ML library that we have. Snap ML. Right. The, when you run that, if you get a failure of the main node, you just lose the job, or what happens at that point? Right. So if, in, in that point, I think if the name node goes down, then the system becomes unusable at that point in time. Right. So what we have, we have did the evaluation on AWS, I think, a few weeks ago, uh, which was, I think, a uh, few hundred nodes. And we run into this issue. But there we had uh, Kubernetes set up in a way that it just restarted our container. Right. So there are external mechanisms through which you can probably ensure that system stays up. But, but when, when main node restarts, you lose all the Yes. Yeah, so there, there we need to have logging and we have to replay. And uh, we are looking into Rathis to store ex state externally to have some sort of um, what was the RPC, what was the modification in the hierarchy and tree. And from there on, it will, someone else has to take over. So we did evaluate. Yes, we did evaluation. We did evaluation on 10 gig and disk. Uh, but the thing we, we don't show those numbers because in most of the cases the performance was bottlenecked by the hardware, right? You see flat line on the 10 gig, right? When you see disk, it's disk is so there's nothing. Um, so but just using Crail is not going to improve your hardware performance from the limit, right? The Crail is meant to uh, improve the situation when you have a high end hardware and you're not getting the performance of the high end hardware, right? Right, but Vanilla Spark here essentially is running on 100 gig, right? So as in, we are not throttling Vanilla Spark to run on 10 gig. So the hardware setup in all the evaluation is identical. The software configuration is identical, except the changes which are specific to the Crail module. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm very curious about your project. That's why. I'm uh, it's good. That's that's that's, that's, that's what. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, is Crail support standalone mode? What is a standalone mode for you? Yeah, sure. You, you can run the whole system on your local machine with a local host. You can, because these three things are just independent Java processes, right? So you can run one name node, one data node, and you can just have micro benchmark as a standalone Java program you can write, and you can just test it out on your local system. And so, so typically what we see as in, because most of the time in our experience, people don't buy one or two servers. They buy usually a rack, right? And within a rack, you have uh, tens of machines, right? Or 20s of machines, you have a switch in between, right? And they are all interconnected. Because the kind of latencies we are talking about, one, two microsecond, they are possible within a rack or two, right? If you go across the data center, then the light of speed of light and other physical reality becomes so you can see in a tens of microseconds. Right. So typical deployment that we see is in a bunch of rack, tens and twenties of servers. We have tested it out up to I think 256 uh, machines. So that was I think I'm going to say eight racks or so, something like that. So that's a typical deployment we see. Yeah. Right, so absolutely, the, 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 it depends upon if you have RDMA hardware, right? Then you offload part of it, right? So your CPU cores become free to do actual compute, right? They are not they are not consumed for doing I/O, so that also helps in a way to uh, give your more compute power to your Spark framework, essentially. So, so I have a let's say I've got an object store in the back, right? Yeah. Um, how do I manage the uh, life cycle of an object uh, if multiple threads are concurrently trying to change it? So if you have, if you, let's say in the key value store, right? If you have a multiple threads which are trying to insert the same key, so there is no explicit concurrency available here, right? So whatever, whoever the last was, it will win. There is atomicity guaranteed. So one will win, but which one we don't, we don't guarantee. That depends upon the RPC traffic and how it will be processed. Yes, so the writes are atomic, right? So, as in, they, so atomic from the point of view, if you already have an existing key, then it will be replaced. 
if you are trying to insert a new key in the system, right, and with the multiple writers, one of will be, one of one one of them will succeed, but which one, we we, we can't guarantee that. So you not, you're not doing any, uh, no, no, you, that that I think um, we we believe that those kind of things could be done outside. Uh, the, the storage system itself doesn't need to provide all the bells and whistles possible in this world. Yeah. Sorry? Sorry, I can't hear you properly. It depends upon your uh, name node capacity, right? Sorry, uh, data node capacity. So we have stored um, hundreds of terabytes so far in our testing, right? So if you need more, you just put more flash drives or DRAM and start more data nodes or reduce more data nodes. You can scale up and down based on your usage. So once we have a Docker image, you can auto scale. So it depends upon just as much data. I, I agree at some point in time, you will hit uh, the limit at the name node, how much metadata it can manage within memory. You will hit that point, but we haven't hit that point. It, that is directly proportional to the size of your block which is by default one megabyte, but uh, that can be changed in order to reduce the pressure on the name node. So one last question. Do you go skiing on the French side or the Swiss side? Uh, to the German side. You go to the German side? Yes, I live in Zurich, right? So I either go in the German side to Austria or uh, in Swiss Alps. But the last ski holidays I had, that was in French side in Wallis. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, I didn't. Um, I have my apologies. <laughs> so, as my question was, uh, do applications need to change to make use of this system, or like via configuration or something, like in case of Spark? Right, right. So, the change is essentially if you are using, let's say, if you are going through the HDFS API, then you have to change the namespace, right? So, crail colon slash less host name, port number, and then rest of the namespace. Uh, if you're going through the key value, then we have our own API, so that changes, right? It has a, it, it, from the configuration-wise, it is the similar what we have in HDFS. There's a configuration file, then the, there's a Crail file system object on which you can create node, create file, and then you get a read stream, write stream. Uh, if you are going to the key value interface, then insert key, look up key, you, can, you get all these calls, right? No, we wrote, we wrote from scratch. And at least in the case of RDMA data node, it's like 300 lines of code. Because data is served using RDMA, and then the data node part is essentially just a connection management. So uh, in your speech, how do you deal with a JVM and a basecamp and dividing to do your PC? Even, even a partial PC would just throw all your GAN data. Yes. And you don't have enough for PC, and for PC would just kill you. Yes. Short answer is we don't. We try to push as far as possible. So what does that mean? That, does that happen? What happens? Yeah, it happens. So one, the experiment that we shown this one, right? Uh, so this one, this was 120 no, 28 node, 12 terabyte of data, and GC time to time did kick in on the name node. So we have to kind of um, adjust our block size because we were started with the 64 kilobyte, which was too small and to store. 12.8 terabyte of data in 64 kilobyte blocks, the number of objects that the name node has to manage, they were just one too many. So the way we manage or we try to manage GC is that, um, because typically what happens when you have a layered system like Hadoop, right? So each layer is uh, developed independently, right? So whenever the data crosses the layer, there's object here, and there's object here, there's object here, right? And each layer generates its own set of objects. So what we have done in Crail essentially is that there's only one buffer object at the bottom. And the ownership of the buffer is usually transferred with the references. So we try to create less object on the fly while the data is traversing through your layer, because we know uh, from the API how the data is accessed, when it is accessed, and these things. So we try to be careful with those. Use that ownership tracking, something like Elasticsearch. Yes, kind of, prim, prim, because at least with the RDMA, you get ownership kind of abstraction that who owns this buffer at what point in time. Is it the network owned? That means you cannot touch it while the network is going transfer. And is it application owned? Then you can transfer it in the rest of the stack. 
it's, it's, you can think of it as a similar idea what you have in SKB in kernel, right? So you can append, prepend header and footer, but the data itself remains in a similar pace. Yes, it, it, this number is essentially is where we made sure that GC doesn't kick in, right? So, but it doesn't kick in. yes, as in like giving more memory, trying to do the best run, right? Yeah. When it does, when it does kick in, yes, you, your system is at least the name node is paused for tens of seconds. Um, I think. So you have to kind of play around. We, we are in the phase. That's why one of the pending items on the list is JVM optimization, right? As not pending item, but it's kind of a, because what we have seen as well, we have to struggle with JVM a lot, right? Because especially because JVM is not meant to operate at these limits at this point in time. That would we feel like there's a lot of on-the-fly objects, and especially when we are integrating with Spark and Scala. Scala is even worse with the JC. Um, there's a, everything essentially has a whole bunch of its own uh, container objects on the fly. Everything there are a lot of syntactic sugar. At the bottom, it's generating new objects. We have seen JIT getting confused. Essentially, you have a very nice performance, and suddenly JITs wake up, and it says, oh, something is wrong. Essentially, it decompiles our code from, um, from the native code into interpreted mode, and then performance collapses. So it, it, it takes a little bit of struggle, and it, it is a kind of ongoing effort. We have figured out a few design patterns, how to optimize JVM for these kind of, but it's ongoing effort. It will be ongoing effort. Yes. So why would you write your data node and name node and at least in C where you have a little more control over stuff or maybe in C++? So, yes. Uh, so our analysis was, OK, look, um, um, memory management in a distributed system is a really hard problem. So And GC is useful for that. Um, yeah, but your use case is, see, GC is, in my mind, I added it right away. Right. No, no. So it could have. It's, Right. Why it, would they do that? The goal is performance. No, no. So that's why. Um, yes. Yeah, so our design point was that okay. First of all, when we started, right. So what 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 were the big things people were using for data processing? It was Spark. It was Hadoop. It was Hive. Right. All these frameworks. Right. And more, almost all of these frameworks are in managed runtime. Right. If you write a system like this, because there are systems like this, if you want to use. RDMA with a file system, you can use Ceph, right? You can use GPFS, you can use uh, ClusterFS, right? So there are solutions like that. Why aren't they used? Because there is a missing step in between. How do you, once you have data in your C library, how do you push into JVM? And then you have to write these JVM back pointer, forward pointer, exit interrupts to, and that is kind of really weak point. This is where the system will collapse, that the, the integration of your native environment with your JVM environment. Yes. Irrespective of how you mark it, so something wide, you just have class dot, because that's the class object serialization. Yes. Now, Avra is so much smaller than GC, so it's avoid serialization. Sorry, sorry? The, not Avra, the Arrow stuff. Yeah. It's designed to be for efficiency in memory processing that you would yep. something like GC. It should work over RDMA and stuff as well, shouldn't it? Should it should, yes. But, the, but the, the goal of serialization is a bit different, right? The, because Spark. Let's take an example of Spark, which we have most experience with, right? Spark is meant for a general purpose audience that who doesn't know the details of serialization and deserialization, right? So out of the box, it uses a Java inter a JVM serialization interface, right? So you have to first switch to Creo, right? That already gives you major performance boosts, right? Then in these benchmarks, right, essentially we went to the next step that what you are proposing is essentially, right? So we look at the objects, and most of the time, they're like a bunch of arrays of ints, uh, double, right? You have strings. These are primitive types, right? You can, you can write serializer with the hand, right? And this, you can insert those serializer, deserializer in Spark. It's a modular interface, right? So you can write that, but most of developers don't, right? They, so that's the thing, that with the flexibility and performance, that's the, and I agree, you can, you, once the arrow becomes a standard, it becomes a bit more easier for us, but Considering the goal of the project, we think that it will come on top of it, right? We don't have to address the issue of serialization, deserialization 
within the storage stack. It will become a part of the layer which has to interact with the compute, obviously. Right? So once the data coming out from the Crail, it will be, let's say, for example, in the arrow format, and then it can fast track through the rest of the compute stack. So right now, you actually need to do more like manual too, right? Yes. Right, they have uh, this unsafe serializer, right, yeah. Yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So serialization, actually, we, this is, we, we are investigating. We have written, uh, we have done a bit of systematic study what type of serializer there are. Can they deliver this type of performance, right? So we have evaluated JVM, Java default serializer, Creo. We have looked into Avro as well. Uh, not, we have evaluated Arrow in a different context with the Parquet and ORC and JSON and in, in terms of file format, not as a, a serialization format. Um, but the general feeling that we have after evaluating all these um, different artifacts is still that they are designed in a way keeping a different trade-offs in mind. They are optimized for the I.O. efficiency and they are designed to trade CPU for the I.O. But in these hardware, it, this hardware, essentially, your CPU is the bottleneck. So if you are trading CPU for faster I.O., you are not getting any performance. Yeah, you do compression. Yes. So you don't do compression. So we actually we worked on a file format, which is going to be published uh, in uh, ATC in July. We have a file format. After evaluating ORC, Parquet, Arrow on 100 gig with this flash, uh, the best performance we got out, out of this was 30 gigabits per second out of 100, which was from Arrow. Uh, Parquet gave us... 15, ORC gave us 18, uh, JSON, Avro, they were like low tens gigabits per second. So in order to deliver 100 gigabits per second across the network, because it was bottlenecked by a file format, we have to design our own file format. Absolutely. Crail, on the other hand, is focusing on making the pipe larger. But I'm, I'm the law kicks in. You have a huge pipe, but your serialization is very slow. You already say that you know CPU is bottleneck. So it does. It is separate bag. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I agree. I agree. But my question is that if you want to get, if your aim is to move spark fast, then would you focus on serialization problems rather than big hardware? No, that's true. No, right, because at the end of the day, it's a, it's a stream, it's a pipe. Networking, network interface is giving you bits. It cannot give you object, right? You have to make object somewhere. So the, the point you made is a fair point, right? I would counter it along the lines that, okay, what happens most of the time what we, when we talk to the customers, right, they buy 100 gig hardware, right? They put it in. They have performance X, they put 100 gig, and they get 5% they get faster. And they are happy with that. As in like, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Then you do a bit of this software um, uh, serialization magic, you get another 5%, right? But what our goal is that fundamentally what we are asking here is that not that we can give you 5% or 10%, we are asking how far away are we from the actual raw hardware performance. That's our target. And what would it take for us to get to that level, right? So the first step is obviously to expose and manage in a systematic way in a data center wide sort of a this distributed data store where at the top of this thing with the different abstractions like key value file or HDFS, um, you get the same performance that you have at the bottom of the stack. That's the first step. Second step is how do we uh, push this data rate that we have it there into the compute framework? And there you have the different file format serialization as a choke points, but even after that, I think in our experience, even the compute frameworks are really slow. They are really slow. They are not meant to process data at this rate. So what happens most of the time is that um, it's, it's like we have designed this really fast Formula One engine, and eventually we ended up putting this Formula One engine in a truck, right? So we, 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 cannot show, we can show that you get 10x performance gain here, but only like 2x shows at the bottom, at the top, sorry, right? So we also have to kind of carefully then look 
um, one by one exactly where the time is spent, how, what is Spark is doing. Most times, Spark has its own set of problems that it is generating objects on the fly. Five times it is copying the data. And, and we had actually talked at the Spark Summit last two years. We had talked this year as well, and we talked to the developers there as well. And when we showed them our evaluation for the performance numbers, they were like, oh, great. Um, we can do 25 gigabits for Shuffle. We didn't know that. We only evaluated on 10 gig or 1 gig, right? So that's the whole idea, that no one is actually systematically looking at the um, next generation of hardware, this 100 gig, and how the current software stacks that we have, how they are going to show what type of performance is there, right? So that's, that's the kind of general theme of our work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that's true, absolutely. So, in your evaluation, mm -hmm. how much of this can go into these systems and how much is not because these are systems and I think a big part of can it could, it can go in the in in those system. I think especially the um, okay, I have to be careful because I'm not part of the core development group which is to, uh, right. No, it, it is good and we want to do that, but the fact with our experience so far, it has been that um, the focus of those projects is essentially stability and speed, right? Not so much performance. Performance is like third aspect of the whole thing, right? So you, people with a Hadoop, let's say, installation would rather have a stable next release and kind of a, like a six months down the line than kind of wait for one year for the performance improvement, right? So, and. And the problem is also that it's, it's such a big ecosystem, right? There are developers all over the world. No single person has a systematic view of how the data bits which are coming from the network are showing up at the top. And, th and there are so many... OK, maybe not. I haven't evaluated Ozone, but for HDFS... So we have evaluated HDFS on the similar uh, setup, right? So between two nodes, the maximum we can get out of HDFS was around 70 gigabits per second out of 100. And for that 70 gigabits out of 100, actually all of our 16 cores were just doing HDFS. So, so if you have a compute on the same node, then essentially there's, there's no cycles left, right? So the, the whole point or whole idea of this project, or generally the, our feeling is that the software stacks are being bloated over and over again, right? And it is fine. There is nothing wrong with that. We have learned to live with them over the last 15, 20 years, right? We were not at this point where the CPU was the bottleneck in the system, right? We are approaching at this point in time where we have to be careful about the CPU processing capabilities and we have to leverage FPGAs and GPUs around it. And we have to see how data is flown in the distributed system among all these devices, right? And the role of the CPU has to be reduced down from, let's say, a global master to just a controller type of setting where it instructs a device A, B, and C that you three are responsible for the data flow and data flows happening between these three devices instead of CPU pulling and pushing data between these three devices, right? And with that mentality in mind, then your software stack also has to kind of adjust that there might be opportunities where you can pre-allocate lots of objects, you can reuse them, you can do ownership, you can do pass references, which kind of um, reduces the overhead in your data path, as well as improves, let's say, the life of a GC and runtime environment, right? So kind of that's a bigger theme essentially in the work. Do you have UV Judas in your training system? Sorry? Do you have UV Judas like that? How does a new person who wants to contribute to training come and work with you? How it should be? Actually, I don't know. We we tag Jiras as new Oh, okay. So we can come in and we know it's a new V Jiras or something else. Okay, we So all of them. I think the RDMA support is with all the distros. Yeah. Sorry? So the RDMA support for Java is essentially what we have developed. 
And this is now part of the Mellanox distribution. So if you download more uh, this uh, OFED library from the Mellanox, you get a driver for JVM from them as well. And for the rest of the stack, the RDM integration is available everywhere. So you can, well, we haven't done the Windows part, but uh, we have done the Red Hat and Debian and Ubuntu usually in our testing. Yes. A four node cluster. <laughs> yes, we have a small four node cluster. Yeah, absolutely. The principal. Yeah. Yes. I think, unfortunately, these are these kind of changes are a bit more subjective to the system, right? So how the caching is implemented, and yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. No, but I think the tagging the Jira is a good idea. I think we can. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much for the attention and lots of interesting questions.